Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, worried, worn out, and spending a lot of money on clean water. How am I going to survive the week after that? Like, you know, I've only got enough for one week. How residents of Iqaluit are coping with the water crisis and why the mayor suspects climate change is to blame. Marketplace investigates pricey commissions in the housing market. Hello. What happens when sellers try to negotiate? Were you left with the impression that your house was almost blacklisted? Absolutely. Prince William takes on the new space race. We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. The great debate over private space flight. And The Canadian men's soccer team makes a run for the World Cup. Alfonso Davies, are you kidding me? This is The National. Tonight, the government of Nunavut has declared a state of emergency in Iqaluit as the effects of the water crisis continue to wreak havoc on the capital city. Thousands of people are worried about their health, worried about the cost of safe water, and worried about growing food insecurity. Some help did show up today. About 19,000 liters of bottled water arrived by plane, courtesy of the territorial government. Within hours, though, it was all gone, distributed to residents, a clear sign of just how desperate the need. But while residents cope with the daily impacts of the crisis, affecting every part of how life is lived, Another concern is gnawing in the background, the suspected cause of the contamination, climate change, meaning this moment may not be one and done. Jackie McKay reports once again tonight from Iqaluit. Mary Lee Sandy Aliak has a one-month-old baby. Usually, she never makes a fuss. The last four days, she's been um, crying a little bit more, fussing quite a bit more. I'm wondering, like, you know, did she get side effects? Baby Amka is on formula that gets prepared with water, meaning until a few days ago, she was consuming the contaminated supply coming from the taps. Her 18-year-old brother has also been having headaches and feeling dizzy. They don't know if the water is to blame, and they're looking for public health guidance. Uh, I really hope the side effects are going to be put out there. These, um, what kind of treatment we can have? How can we clear our system? Residents are still waiting for the water to be tested out of territory. So Sandy Aliak has filled her kitchen with water bought from the grocery store or gathered from the river and boiled. But with five kids and a dog, it's a lot of work and costs are mounting. Now having purchased $300 worth of juice and water for the kids, I mean, what am I, I how, how am I going to survive the week after that? Like, you know, I've only got enough for one week. Many people in Akaluit are turning to the local food center for help. It's serving a record number of people this week. There's a really strong correlation between food security and water security. So even if people do have access to affordable, healthy food, if they don't have clean water to wash their food or cook their food with, um, then they're, they're coming here for the daily meal. The city has struggled with water issues for years. Melting permafrost has shifted the city water pipes, causing them to break. The mayor suspects that's what's to blame for this crisis. It's most likely caused by uh, climate change and the, the, ground, the ground shifting and uh, maybe the tank getting um, uh, cracked. This expert has studied a Halloween's water system and says a significant investment in water resources is needed because of the changing environment. This is a singular incident um, and that there is a broader water security challenge for many northern and indigenous communities in Canada. That broader discussion on water security um, that, ha that has to happen. The government of Nunavut days before an election has declared a state of emergency here. A move it says will speed up additional help. Another plane full of water is expected to arrive soon. Jackie McKay, CBC News, Halloween. Now let's turn to Canada's increasingly uneven COVID-19 story as the fourth wave continues to ravage the prairies. Per capita, Saskatchewan's situation remains the worst among Canada's provinces by two measures. New cases with over 500 per 100,000 people and new deaths with almost 7 per 100,000. Now, hospitals and ICU beds are full, the system on the brink, and with no new restrictions and no requests for outside help, 
Well, Mayor Issa shows us frustration with the provincial government is getting louder. You're all set, I'm ready to go. With his province's health care system on the verge of collapse, Saskatchewan's health minister sat down for his flu vaccine today. Given the pressures that we are seeing in our health care system, it is especially important this year. But with one of the lowest COVID vaccination rates in the country, he wants people to get the other jab as well. Unvaccinated COVID-19 patients are pushing Saskatchewan's resources to the brink. Surgeries and other medical services have been cancelled. Most of Saskatchewan's 135 ICU beds are full. Adults have even been admitted into pediatric wards. And with Canada's highest per capita rate of deaths, doctors are sounding alarm bells. We are really uh, one or two major car accidents away from a situation where people may not get the care that they really need. Despite the crisis, no new restrictions have been announced and Saskatchewan hasn't asked Ottawa for federal help. We're trying the same thing over and over again and we're expecting different results. This is insanity. The government is in talks with Ontario and Manitoba about potentially sending critical care patients out of province. But the health minister says Saskatchewan has enough workers to handle the load. They have uh, the resources in place to meet our needs. And if we get to a point where we can't be able to provide that quality of care, then we're going to look at other provinces to be able to assist us. The opposition leader called for the health minister to resign. Yeah. He's lying to Saskatchewan people and he's doing so in a way that will cost people their lives. It's hard to overstate how serious Saskatchewan's situation is. ICU nurses and respiratory therapists are in high demand, and healthcare staff that are available are in danger of burning out. Omera Issa, CBC News, Regina. Well, with another 30 deaths reported today in Alberta, COVID-19 remains a big concern there, but pressure on hospitals is slowly easing, thanks in part to the generosity of healthcare workers from away. Julia Wong shows us how strong ties forged in the oil patch are bringing East Coasters to battle COVID in Fort Mac. Stepping up to help the Fort McMurray Hospital was a no-brainer for nurse practitioner Jennifer Richard. This is what I truly love to do. The Newfoundland and Labrador government sent her, four registered nurses and two doctors to work mainly in Fort McMurray's overloaded ICU. There's a mix of COVID-19 patients and patients who have other diagnosis. Um, so we're, we are caring for any patient um, that might be in the ICU right now, regardless of their uh, diagnosis. Case numbers rose sharply in northern Alberta after the summer. Now ICU capacity is well above what it is normally. The government has flown patients down to larger hospitals in Edmonton. The additional hands mean room for two more patients, but the system is still on the brink. It will allow us to keep North Zone and Fort McMurray and the regional municipality Wood Buffalo patients closer to home. Uh, but yeah, we were, we were definitely um, in expansion, so uh, probably unsustainable in the longer term. Today, Premier Jason Kenney tweeted a letter of gratitude for the help to a province with deep ties to the city. Fort McMurray is well connected with Newfoundland, <clears throat> and so to me it was, uh, there's an emotional aspect to it, I think. With a long history of oil sands workers from Newfoundland and Labrador, Fort McMurray is lovingly called the province's second largest city. A fact not lost here, the hospital hoisted the flag of Newfoundland and Labrador to welcome the new team. Some of our nurses uh, that are traveling on our team have family and friends that are here. Uh, we have some colleagues that are working here that we graduated nursing school with. For Richard, the call to help rang so loud, she deployed just days after getting married. We were able to have a wonderful honeymoon and I arrived here a couple days later than the team. Called to her duty as a nurse in a community so close to the heart of Newfoundlanders. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. In neighboring BC, a dramatic move from officials tonight to combat climbing cases in the north of the province. We, we have thrown everything in but the kitchen sink, and the kitchen sink went in a week ago. We are doing everything we can to support the North, and we will continue to do that. So starting at midnight tonight, indoor and outdoor gatherings will be limited to fully vaccinated people, among other restrictions. 
Northern BC has the highest rate of transmission in the province and just 69% of eligible residents in the region are fully vaccinated. Well, some residents of Lytton, B.C. had hoped that today would bring closure about what happened before a deadly, fast-moving wildfire tore through the town this summer. But as Renee Filipponi shows us, a report just released has left those at the heart of the tragedy still hungry for answers. Community members took a moment to say thank you and goodbye to volunteers from out of town who spent months cleaning up the rubble. It takes a community to recover. But Linton First Nation Chief Janet Webster says she's disappointed after the Transportation Safety Board found there is no evidence that railway activity caused the fire. I feel that it wasn't a thorough investigation. Transportation Board came in nine days after the fire and a lot of uh, stuff was ruffled through. It was late June, in the middle of a record heat wave, when fire tore through the community, killing two people and leaving little behind. At the time, many locals speculated flying sparks from a train caused the blaze. Today, the TSB says they didn't find a connection and said their investigation is over. BC Wildfire Service and the RCMP are continuing to investigate, but unless we can link the Lytton fire directly to a railway transportation occurrence, we really don't have further jurisdiction. I think for the, the people of Lytton, we, we need to have some kind of closure. This is all that's left behind of Denise O'Connor's home. She was hoping today would bring answers for her and others who have been left homeless and have no idea what their future holds. I'm still trying to figure out where I'm going to go, what, it, what it's going to look like for me, because, you know, we're not going, we're not going home anytime soon. Former firefighter Alfred Higginbottom took these videos that night and says he still thinks about the fire every day and worries it could happen again. If you don't have accountability, you're never going to learn from your mistakes or anyone's mistakes. It's ludicrous. This investigation may be over, but the Transportation Safety Board says it's taking a broader look at how extreme heat can increase the risk of fires started by trains. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is expected to pick his front bench soon. CBC News has learned Trudeau could announce his post-election cabinet as early as Monday, October 25th, as well as announce a date for the return of Parliament. The biggest change could come in the Defence Ministry, where many senior Liberals suggest that Harjit Sajjan will be shuffled to a new portfolio. More to come on this in At Issue, coming up. Now, one of the campaign promises the new cabinet will be expected to fulfill, access to affordable housing. But real estate, of course, is a big business. Agents and their brokerages make billions in commissions. So our colleagues at CBC Marketplace went house hunting to see what happens when a seller offers less than standard commission to agents. Here's David Common with the surprising results. Joanne Petit is selling her house, but doesn't want to pay the 5% commission real estate agents expect. That's about 75 grand. It's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. So she's selling privately, but will agents representing buyers still come when the payday is smaller? Joanne is still offering buyer agents 1% of the sale, about $14,000. She's been warned by other agents they won't come. Were you left with the impression that your house was almost blacklisted? Absolutely. That's how it was referred to me. Hello! So we're posing as undercover buyers, asking agents to show us Joanne's house. I've been trying to reach them to see, like, what's the problem. The first agent tells us she can't reach Joanne. But I haven't heard back from them. Joanne says that's not true. We never received a call. She told us she called. I... She called and left a message. No, no message was left. That's disgusting. Is that steering? Yes, of course that is. Real estate lawyer Lisa Laredo says steering away from a low commission home is illegal. It's in absolute contravention of the code of ethics. On to another agent. The home is 200,000 overpriced. Do you wanna go and see it? The price is consistent with similar houses in the area. Besides, that agent tells Joanne a different story. When we told her there would only be a 1% commission, she said, I'll keep my clients to myself. 
when Marketplace reached out to the agents who steered, both denied doing so. But it doesn't appear to be isolated. Some agents may be very cognizant of what they're getting paid and push their buyer to another home. We called agents across Canada. Many told us steering happens all the time. It's not right and it's not ever supposed to happen, but it does happen. RICO, the real estate regulator in Ontario, calls all this troubling. They wouldn't talk to us on camera, but did send a bulletin to agents warning them steering is illegal and that it must stop. Mm, okay, so David, if I'm buying a home, how would I know if this is happening? Yeah, it's a good question. You wouldn't. Most buyers aren't in direct contact with the seller asking what their own agent is saying. So while steering is illegal, it's next to impossible to prove or track. No one, though, of course, is saying that real estate agents shouldn't be paid for their time and expertise and experience. Critics are just saying there should be more consumer choice, that commission rates are already hard to negotiate. And as you saw, there can be consequences like steering. Some believe that's anti-competitive in a system that can be very lucrative. And remember, Andrew, Canadians pay some of the highest commissions for real estate in the world. Mm. David Common, thank you very much. And you can tune in tomorrow night for the full results of Marketplace's investigation. That's 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and GEM. The federal government has responded to the fifth estate investigation we brought you last night. It was a look at the Canadian government's dealings with the Chinese vaccine maker and whether that doomed relationship ultimately set back Canada's effort to produce COVID vaccines here. In a statement, the National Research Council says the work with CanSino in no way slowed down the Canadian effort to secure vaccines and that the work with the company was only one of multiple avenues pursued to secure vaccines for Canadians. We have some breaking news from the U.S. tonight. Former President Bill Clinton is being treated in a California hospital. A statement from Clinton's spokesperson confirmed he was admitted to the University of California's Irvine Medical Center on Tuesday evening for a non-COVID-19 related infection. His doctors say the 75-year-old is responding well to antibiotics and he's said to be on the mend and in good spirits. Well, fighting in the streets of Beirut today left six dead and dozens wounded. As Lebanon grapples with multiple crises, the violence brings back haunting memories for so many. Here's Margaret Evans. Beirut today. The hollow rattle of bullets bouncing off buildings, sectarian militias exchanging fire, and people running for cover. My wife was hiding downstairs, but our neighbor was killed, says this man. She was shot in the head with a bullet. The shooting began during a protest organized by the militant Shia Muslim group Hezbollah against a judge investigating last year's huge explosion at the Beirut port. Hezbollah says snipers from a Christian faction known as the Lebanese forces started shooting at demonstrators, an accusation already denied video shows gunmen on the street with assault rifles and the thud of rocket-propelled grenades could be heard on residential streets, all shuddering reminders of Lebanon's long-ago civil war, still living close to the surface. I was 10 or 11 years old, says this shop owner. The same scene that was in my head as a kid, it's now repeating. It is yet another blow to Lebanon. Already on the brink of economic collapse, its ruling class is divided by sectarianism, but united in corruption. The investigation into the port explosion is expected to point to political negligence. Hezbollah wants the judge removed, accusing him of bias. Experts say today's violence may derail the investigation. So, so today they shot at the Hezbollah demonstration. Who says? If tomorrow uh, you do a demonstration of a different politic in support of the judge, uh, maybe there will be snipers too. The Beirut explosion destroyed whole city blocks and killed more than 200 people last year when 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate stored at the port for years ignited. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. As some of the world's richest battle for supremacy in the private space race, a royal is taking them to task. We need 
some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. Coming up, the debate over space tourism. Plus. Davies keeps it himself! Goal! A stunning goal by Alfonso Davies. Could he lead Canada's men's soccer team to their first World Cup in decades? And a pandemic musical tribute that has one neighborhood in a spat. Nothing against bagpipes if you want to play them, but respect your neighbors. We are back in two. Welcome back. Some of the world's richest men have been pouring their wealth into the space race, sparking questions over whether that money could be better spent. Well, today, Prince William became the latest to weigh in. He told the BBC billionaires should focus on fixing Earth's problems first. Not everyone agrees. Lauren Pelly brings us the debate over space travel. For space tourists, blasting off offers a new perspective on the planet. Holy hell. Actor William Shatner was brought to tears. It was so moving to me. But now a prominent critic, the man who is second in line to the throne, questions the merits of space travel. Speaking to the BBC about climate change, Prince William said... We need some of the world's greatest brains and minds fixed on trying to repair this planet, not trying to find the next place to go and live. Space travel has seized the attention of some of the world's richest men. Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson and Elon Musk have all gotten into the game. In this sort of race that we have between different companies to kind of colonize the space tourism and monopolize the space tourism sector uh, are completely tone deaf to the realities of um, the sustainability challenges that we face right now. All that effort, all that energy and all those emissions raise eyebrows for some environmentalists. But others say space exploration could play a key role in helping solve the climate crisis. With just a small fleet of, of basic little sensing satellites, we can take the temperature and health and understand the long term, what's going on with the polar ice cap and the snow cover of the entire planet on a daily basis. One, release, release, release. Then there's that awe factor of seeing the Earth from above. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. And the more people that we get to go to space and have this overview effect, the more that we're going to be seeing people putting their resources and their talents towards protecting the Earth. But for now, that out-of-this-world experience is limited to this world's rich and famous. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Now, CBC News is committed to showing you how climate change is affecting our communities and our world. Tonight, nations across the Arctic Circle are making their concerns known at a conference in Reykjavik, Iceland. Chris Brown is there. Iceland is bleak, but beautiful and like other parts of the Arctic, also in peril from a warming climate. This week, Reykjavik is hosting Arctic nations, and to drive home what's at stake, organizers put a melting block of glacial ice outside the venue. We who live in the high north, we face storm clouds on the horizon, because the Arctic as we know it is changing fast. And in the conference corridors, these Icelandic students told us the changes are impossible to miss. We have seen uh, multiple heat records uh, during this summer. There was a glacier called Auk, very close to where I grew up, and it doesn't exist anymore. It, it, it's just melted off the map. This Arctic Circle Assembly has become known as the Davos of the North, a forum to discuss big ideas for the future. But with the UN's climate conference now just two weeks away, the fear that nations will miss key climate targets is dominating the discussion. Many big polluting nations have not said how they intend to cut emissions and a $100 billion global financing package remains incomplete. Scotland's first minister, who's hosting the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, implored countries to get it done. Climate change is the greatest challenge facing our planet and COP26 is our best chance to address it. 
Iceland may have a few innovations of its own. A delegation from Denmark visited a local plant that sucks carbon straight out of the atmosphere. The Danish foreign minister told us he believes richer nations must embrace new tech. The most cheapest way actually to produce electricity is to deploy wind turbines in Denmark uh, compared to building a new for example, coal power plant. The Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. The hope here this week is that it's still not too late to slow it down. Chris Brown, CBC News in Reykjavik, Iceland. Well, next on The National, you may already have heard Squid Game is officially Netflix's biggest original series, but did you know it's so popular that even the show's candy is trending? <laughs> Coming up, how a Montreal store owner is capitalizing on the craze. But first, Rosie's here with At Issue. Hey, Andrew, tonight we're going to talk about Quebec's decision to postpone a key deadline. We want to give the unvaccinated staff extra time to collect their dose. How this extension could play out politically for Quebec and Ottawa. Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us to talk about that and more right after this. The Prime Minister is hard at work on the transition uh, and is working hard at selecting his new cabinet and it will be a pleasure for him to reveal all of that in due course. Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Chrystia Freeland speaking in Washington earlier today. She is the one cabinet minister who we already know will be holding on to her positions in government. And we've now learned that the rest of the Liberal cabinet will be revealed as early as October 25th, just over a month after the federal election. So what does this timeline tell us about what's happening behind the scenes, if anything? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see all of you. So we're going to get the official uh, date tomorrow. It's, it's likely the 25th, the 26th. Does this tell you anything about uh, how the transition is unfolding and, and, and sort of how they're getting their agenda in shape? Um, I'll start with you, Chantal. Uh, yes and no. They don't seem to be in a particular hurry, but then there are um, logistical or structural issues to deal with. For one, the last uh, Quebec recount uh, took place this week on Tuesday. And it so happens that the person who kept the seat is a liberal uh, female MP who could be part of the next cabinet. So if you're going to build, I mean, to build a cabinet with parity, regional representation, it's like bu building a house of cards. You need to know what cards you're playing with. Yeah, that, that seems reasonable, a reasonable thing. Uh, Andrew, what do you make of, of the time it's taking? I mean, in 2015, it took like two weeks, I think. And, and in 2019, it took more like a month. Well, you'll recall that the reason we had to have the election was because the opposition was holding <laughs> up the urgent work of government uh, in the Commons and in the Senate. Uh, so, OK, we, we uh, dissolved the House. We had a summer break. We had an election. And now we're going to have, we're more than a month into a point of cabinet and who knows much, how much longer to recall parliament. Um, you know, in the UK, the parliament comes back in a few days after each election. Mm. Now, I grant you the bigger country, maybe it takes a few, give them a few more days and maybe a few more days because our, our uh, cabinets have become so elephantine. Uh, but two months without meeting parliament uh, is a little longer than it needs to be. Uh, the government of the day is supposed to be able to face parliament on any day and, and command its confidence. And the longer the governments don't meet parliament, the more they convey hmm. uh, a certain about that. Okay, Althea, your thoughts on it? I don't disagree with anything Andrew said, but I, I think that there were a couple of logistical issues they needed to sort out. I mean, some of it is the prime minister's travel schedule. Some of it is the governor general's travel schedule. Yeah. Um, there is pressure to have, you know, they ran on getting big things done to have you know, their full cabinet and parliament resume earlier. Um, but I think they also want to avoid mistakes of the past. And a lot of new female cabinet ministers will be new to the people around the prime minister. And so making sure that you do not make mistakes at the front end, I don't think is a bad thing. And I wouldn't criticize them for it. Um, also, this they're playing, to use Jonathan's analogy, with a whole new set of cards in some ways. I know there's also... Um, I don't know what the cabinet's going to end up looking like, but, you know, behind the scenes, we're told that there might be some difficult discussions to be had with 
current cabinet ministers. Yeah. And so you want to allow that process, I think, to happen in, a, in an yeah. organic way. And the last thing I'll say is they've had issues with security clearances in the past. So um, that is another consideration that might explain why things are taking a little bit longer. I feel like uh, Toby the dog wants in, but Chantal wants <laughs> one comment before I change topics too. Chantal. Yeah, before before Toby takes yeah. my spot yeah. here, yeah. yeah, I'm fighting for it big time. Uh, I'm more curious to tell you the truth by now uh, with the timing of the return of Parliament. Uh, mm -hmm. Parliament usually the recesses the week of Remembrance Day, November 11th. If uh, the return of Parliament is scheduled after that. I will conclude that Justin Trudeau wants to spend as little time as possible in this Parliament where he does not hold a majority. So I'm curious to see what day they pick. Okay, and we should find that out tomorrow as well. I, wa I want to switch yeah. gears if I can. Uh, tomorrow was supposed to be the deadline for all healthcare workers in Quebec to be fully vaccinated mm -hmm. or be suspended without pay. Uh, they've changed that, they've backtracked. Here's what the health minister there had to say about that yesterday. We took the difficult decision last night, late last night, to postpone the implementation of the decree on mandatory vaccination in the health network until November 15. We want to give the unvaccinated staff extra time to collect their dose. But I want to be clear, we will apply the mandatory vaccination for healthcare workers the decision became uh, to push it back because there's real concern that they would end up with not enough people to work. We're talking thousands and thousands of people. Um, Chantal, I'll start with you on that, on this, because you're in Quebec. Is, is this blinking first uh, a concern that other provinces, the federal government, should be thinking about here? Probably. Probably less so if you're not talking about workers that are so essential to make your health mm -hmm. system operate. So if you're in a province where you have uh, lots of them, maybe you can afford to just not blink. In the case of Quebec, uh, there was just uh, no choice. Now, that being said, that's not an argument against setting a deadline for people in the healthcare system to get vaccinated, because over that period until yesterday, Half of the people who were not vaccinated in the system did uh, start or get vaccinated. Beyond that, of course, it does cost you a political capital. And one of the problems with that is that uh, moral authority is what has gotten citizens to respect a lot of guidelines. And this is one of the first big times where moral authority has failed in the face of defiance. And that's that's interesting because it is in Quebec where there has been, you know, some success in, in keeping that moral authority. Andrew, what, what did you make of the decision? Uh, it sends a very bad signal, not just in Quebec, but to the rest of the country. It will embolden uh, the anti-vaxxers who we've discovered are much more numerous and much more determined uh, than perhaps we had thought previously. Um, the calculation, I guess, of the government of Quebec was that they were so determined they'd rather lose their jobs uh, then get vaccinated, or at least they weren't willing to test that proposition. But I don't think there's any other word for it but blinked. Um, perhaps if they are um, sufficiently strict and, and determined from this point on that, that the damage of that can be unwound, maybe some combination of uh, giving, a, giving a little here and then being firmer from, from now on, maybe that will work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would think it's, it's going to send bad signals. And of course, they're not the only ones. If you look at the federal plan, uh, they basically, they, they, they're not, they don't have mandatory vaccines. They, you have to attest uh, that you've been vaccinated. Don't, you have to show yeah. proof. And supposedly they're going to audit all these attestations. Well, I'll believe that when I see it. Uh, Althea, I mean, it, you do have to allow, I think, for reasonable sort of uptake between when you make the, the threat and, and the deadline in hopes that that works. I, I guess they just need longer in Quebec, and maybe that's what other governments should think about, too. Well, I'm going to split the issues up into two. I think for the federal government, the reason that they went with an attestation to begin with was because they couldn't really check everybody's vaccination status remotely, and they wanted to get things done by the deadline that they had suggested. I also don't think they're dealing with necessarily critical staff, not to um, disparage any of the work that federal public servants do, but they are not like life and death situations. Not frontline workers, like the yeah. Nurses. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I do not think that this is going to make the federal government change its course, even if there are lots of people in the bureaucracy who decide not to get vaccinated. Quebec is facing, like many other provinces, but an acute 
staffing shortage when it comes to nurses. Like just in our region here in Ottawa, in Get Snow on the other side, there's 350 nurses that are required just to avoid having the current nurses doing um, overtime. Okay. So they're already dealing with a problem to begin with. And I think in some ways, it's hard to criticize a government for doing the right thing when it comes to people's health and safety. And you would want them to contingency plan. And if it takes them another month to sort out what it would mean if they have hundreds of nurses not showing up for work, then that is the wise decision. And I think that that is one of the reasons why you had opposition parties in Assemblée Nationale, for example, asking the CAC government to do this. Okay, we've got to leave it there. I, I'd love to talk more about those staffing shortages because they seem to be happening across the country. So, But we'll put that on ice for another time. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, and before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we'll talk about Jason Kenney and what else is on the ballot for Albertans uh, during next Monday's municipal elections. You can find that conversation on any major podcast app and our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And with that, I'll toss it back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. All right, thanks, Rosie. Next on The National, it is a goal we just cannot stop watching. Keeps it himself! Goal! All right, now expectations are rising about the World Cup. Stay with us. Julia Grosso from Vancouver to win it for Canada! <laughs> Well, who could forget that moment when, with a shootout goal, Canada's women's soccer team won gold at the Olympics in Tokyo, their best ever result at the Games. And keeping that momentum going, they are starting a celebration tour across Canada next week. Now, Canada's national men's soccer team has a long way to go to reach that level of success. But Jamie Strachan has more on a game and a star player finally putting the men in the limelight as well. Alfonso Davies keeps it himself! Goal! In a country used to celebrating goals scored on the ice, Alfonso Davies' dazzling goal scored on the grass at Toronto's BMO Field will be talked about for years. An individual piece of brilliance! Tied at one with Panama in the second half in a key World Cup qualifying game, the 20-year-old Edmonton native sprinted from his own end, stealing the ball from the Panamanian defender just before it went out of bounds. Moments later, the ball was in the back of the net. In my mind, I was like, just shoot the ball. So I shot the ball across the, across the keeper, and you know, I'm happy that it went in the net. Longtime soccer watchers say Canada has never seen a player quite like Davies. You know, just a world-class play. I don't know that many players in the world could pull that off. It really was one, one in a million play. Davies is part of a new generation of players aiming to make Canada's men's team relevant again. Canada has qualified for the World Cup once back in 1986, but this team has fans excited. More than 25,000 people packed BMO Field for the game. Some even took home a special souvenir. It was incredible, seeing the players just going to the game. You know, the fans were right behind us, right there. And these guys have never felt that before. And they, they, they said it coming off the field. They've never felt that before in a Canadian shirt. This game was played at an intense level with numerous altercations. But Canada's head coach says his team is on a mission. You know, we, we're not going to be the peacekeepers. We're not going to... You know, let people walk over us. We're, we're, we're here to fight. Eight teams from North and Central America are fighting for three guaranteed spots. And midway through the grueling months-long qualification process, Canada currently sits in third place. And for the first time in a long time, there is a lot to cheer about. Alfonso Davis! Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. All right, fingers crossed. An Ontario man thought he would spread some pandemic joy in his neighborhood with this. Well, instead, it has brought on a bit of a neighborhood spat. How it is playing out next. Welcome back. So you know this, the pandemic has started all sorts of trends like daily or weekly concerts in some close-knit neighborhoods. But in one southwestern Ontario neighborhood, pandemic piping has turned into a squabble over the sound. Here's Halagunay. Peter Hummel, also known as Peter Piper, plays the pipes almost every day in the southern Ontario town of Fergus. 
I am a firm believer in support and frontline workers. The purpose for me was to gather support for them. The town isn't shy about its Scottish roots. And now Peter has become a staple with his evening shows. Since Pete's been playing, it's brought us together and we, um, we've... One big family. Yeah, we're yeah. one big family now. The intent was to spread joy, but it turns out some neighbours would rather not hear the pipes. I can't watch TV, I have to close the window. This neighbour says that in fact, it's the backyard practices that are the most disruptive. Nothing against bagpipes if you want to play them, but respect your neighbours. Splinter is one of two neighbours who told CBC News they filed formal noise complaints. It started to get like, you know, lots of vulgarity. Lots of swearing, air horns going off, uh, quasi threats about, you know, what, the, where the bagpipes could go. I've sworn at him a few times. That's just out of frustration because he wouldn't quit. I'm, I'm sorry for doing that, but I mean, if he wants to be ignorant, then I'll be ignorant back. With the help of a friend, Peter had this lawn sign made. More than 85 were sold for charity throughout the region. Everyone knows piping isn't a crime. Peter says he received a total of five visits from provincial police and regional bylaw informing him of noise complaints. He was told he wasn't breaking any rules. You're not allowed to do noises that might impact your neighbours after nine o'clock, um, but at seven o'clock there is no real bylaw. So I kind of said, <laughs> I'm not going to stop doing this till the pandemic's over. I'm still doing it. Peter has since toned down the outdoor practice time and the complaints have stopped for now. Halagoname, CBC News, Fergus, Ontario. Okay, a quick peek at something we've got coming up tomorrow. A conversation with Matt Damon, Ben Affleck and writer Nicole Hall of Centre about their latest film, The Last Duel, hitting theatres. One of us has lied. Let us let God decide. And here's the thing, for Damon and Affleck, it's their first screenplay in almost 25 years since Goodwill Hunting. I can only imagine it must be, as a working relationship, either wonderfully efficient or terribly inefficient. That's funny. Actually, we've, we've run the gamut. I think when we started out, we were terribly inefficient, and that's what kind of put us off writing. We never thought we'd have enough time to do it again. Um, but just kind of through by osmosis, by making movies for 25 years, we've kind of figured out structure. There's also a difference when you're writing and it's just you and your friend, you know, you, you, but bringing in a writer you really respect, who you feel like is a real writer and you have to do it in front of her, you kind of like, you sort of, um, you know, you, you sit up a little straighter. At least Matt did. You can catch that tomorrow right here on The National. All right, Squid Game is Netflix's latest hit, a gory, wild thriller that has viewers on edge. But for one Montrealer, a scene from the show brought back some childhood memories, and now he's bringing one of his favorite sweet treats to his community here. His story, next. Well, a little bit of Squid Game, Netflix's latest hit, heavy on the thrills, and for one Montrealer, it brought on a bit of nostalgia, too. So in the show, there is a tense scene where contestants have to cut shapes out of a brittle kind of Korean candy to save their lives. Montreal, Robert Kim watched, gave it a go of his own, and turned them into a bestseller at his store. Here's our moment. We started this on Saturday, last Saturday. We posted it on Instagram and Facebook from, from the store, and then in a less than an hour, we almost sold out all the products. I watched Squid Game. I finished it in two days. Actually, I just loved it. it. Reminds of my young childhood. We are just happy to introduce and show it to the people. When they, they people come to buy it, and also some people didn't know about it. They just love it. We got very surprised. We didn't expect that quick reaction though. I came to Canada when I was in 1980, so 31 years ago. After 30 years, I got the chance to show people what Korea is about, and then people love it. 
So he is fantastic. So <laughs> I, I looked this up. It's not, doesn't seem that difficult. It's just sugar and baking soda. It seems like it might be easy to make, but chemistry is a tricky thing. <laughs> it is not as simple as it sounds. You don't just stick, stick them in a bowl. Yeah, and apparently just not. Shake it up. <laughs> I got to watch uh, this show. I feel like there's a lot that I'm missing out on. A lot of references that uh, people are using. <laughs> Could, uh, yeah, I could take some time to do that. That's the National for this October 14th. Have a great night. Good night.